you want to start the recording? It's on? Okay. Okay, let us get started. So, welcome to the spring 2019 edition of uh, 677. I am going to be the instructor for this class. My name is Prashant and uh, what we will do today is uh, review the syllabus for the class so that you are all familiar with what this course is going to be about in terms of topics covered and so on. And then we will do a quick introduction to the, uh, to the topic of distributed system. Okay. So, let us get started. So, let us start with the course syllabus. Okay. That is going to lay out the expectations for the course. Uh, so, the course is titled distributed and operating systems. So, we will cover a mix of distributed systems topics and operating systems topics in the course. Okay. Uh, the course web page is shown there. That is the URL that you will need to know. I will send that out. I think I did send that out in an email earlier today. Okay. Most of you probably, if you are registered for this course, you should have gotten that email. Uh, the course syllabus, everything I am going to talk about uh, as far as the syllabus is concerned is also posted on that web page. All right. So, the course actually has two sections. This is the classroom section okay? uh, and there is another section that is following along. Uh, they are going to not come to class. We record the, uh, the class as you see and uh, I am going to post all the videos on uh, channel where the other section can uh, follow along. Okay. Now, the videos are also available to, uh, so, so the videos are also available to all of you, but that is not a reason to stop coming to class. Okay. There will be class participation points that I have put into the grading scheme that should encourage all of you to come and participate. If you just stop showing up and just follow along as far as the video is concerned, you should do fine, but you won't be eligible for your class participation point. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, but as far as uh, the rest of the class is concerned, uh, both sections are going to do the same work. Okay, same homework, same exam, same programming assignments. Uh, everything is the same. The only difference is you all come here to class, and the other section does not. They get the uh, recorded lecture on the next day. Okay. Now, it is especially important both for the purpose of this class and yourself as well as your other colleagues who do not come to class to make the class as interactive as possible. Okay. Ask questions if something is not clear, uh, you want to get more information about something, ask questions and so on. That will not only clarify the material for you and everyone who is here, but also your colleagues who cannot actually come to class and ask questions. Of course, they can ask questions later, but it is much easier if you are, uh, if you have more interactive dialogue that is going on during the lecture. Okay? So, the goal is not for me to stand here and talk for an hour, 15 minutes. Okay? It is to make this more of an interactive class, so that we all get something out of it. So, with that, let me introduce the course staff. So, as I said, I am the instructor for this course. There are several st uh, uh, students who are going to help with the class. Okay. Uh, one of the TAs, John, is actually here. Uh, if you want to raise your hand. Okay. So, that is uh, his picture there. So, he is one of the two TAs. The other TA is Bin Wang. He is currently not here, uh, but I will introduce you to him soon. Okay. And uh, we will also announce office hours and so on as we go along. Uh, there are three grading assistants for the course. You do not really need to interact with them for the most part, because uh, most of your interactions will be either with me or with the two TAs. Okay. My office hours are already here posted here. On Mondays, I am going to have office hours just before the lecture. Okay. On Wednesdays, we will have office hours right after the lecture. Okay. So, if you have any course conflict, hopefully you do not have course conflict on both of those slots. So, you can come and talk to me in during one of those slots. Okay. So, those are Mondays and Wednesdays. We will soon announce office hours for the TAs and uh, make sure that there is somebody to see every day of the week, Monday through Friday. Okay. Someone will have office hours every day of the week. Okay. So, those are the course the staff. Uh, now, as far as the textbook for this course is concerned, uh, we use the Tannenbaum book. Okay. 
Uh, about two years ago, the book basically became available for free. So, you do not really need to buy anything. Okay? Uh, the third edition of the book, which is also available in an inexpensive printed form, it looks like this. Uh, but you do not really need to buy this, because you, you can just go to that website, the author's website and get a PDF, legally get a PDF for no charge. Okay? Uh, the second edition, which is the older version of this book, is also available as a PDF, and I would encourage you to get both versions. Okay? The material is uh, little more updated in the third edition, but the structure of the second edition is more aligned with the topics we are going to cover. They moved some material around in the third edition, all the material is still there, but it is uh, separated out, not in terms of the topics we will follow here. So, I have both of those PDFs. There's no harm in downloading two PDFs. Okay? And I think the second edition is more aligned with the topics we are going to cover in sequence here. Okay? But either of those two should work. Any questions about the book? Okay. All right. So, as far as the course outline is concerned, which is what are the topics we are going to cover in the class, today we are going to do an introduction. Okay? So, what are distributed systems and uh, how they work, why do we need to study them and so on. Okay, next time, we will talk about distributed systems architectures, high level architectures for designing distributed systems. Then we will go into distributed communications, which is going to be about RPCs and socket programming, stream oriented communication and so on. Some of that material you may have seen in a networking class. Okay? That is okay. Uh, there will be more stuff that you will learn here in addition to those basics. Okay? And then we look at uh, distributed scheduling, which includes processes and threads, not how you schedule them on a single machine, but on a distributed system of machines. And in that context, we will also look at things like virtualization. Okay? Then we look at distributed naming, DNS, directory services and so on, that assist you in designing large scale distributed systems. Okay? And then. Uh, uh, for a good uh, several classes, we are going to talk about what I call canonical problems in distributed systems. Uh, we will look at several different problems that arise often in designing various kinds of distributed systems, which includes distributed locks, leader election, distributed transactions, clock synchronization and variety of similar topics. Okay? So, that is going to take us several uh, classes to cover that one bullet there uh, and that is uh, going to be uh, sort of an introduction to some of the basic concepts that underlie all distributed systems. And then we will look at things like replication and consistency uh, in the context of distributed systems, also file systems. Uh, then we will look at fault tolerance, how do you handle failures in distributed systems. Uh, we will look a little bit at security in distributed systems. I am de-emphasizing that topic a little bit, because now there is a course called Secure Distributed Systems, which is what I do in one class is actually covered in an entire semester. So, if that is of interest to you, that is the course to look at, but we will look at it in brief here, okay, just for completeness. Uh, and then we will have several advanced topics, including distributed middleware, cloud computing, green computing. Some of this is dependent on how much time we have. Okay. Uh, there are often snow closures, as you know, during this semester. So, I do not actually know how many lectures we can hold. Uh, plus minus 2 is often the case. Okay. But if time permits, we will go into several of these topics. Okay. Any questions on the topics? Okay. So, very quick note about the course grading. Uh, so, we will have a combination of written homeworks, programming assignments and exams. Okay. So, homeworks are 8 percent of the grade. Okay. Programming assignments and the exam are the bulk of the grade. Okay. So, equal, uh, three, uh, pro, it says 3 to 4, but realistically I think it is going to be 3. Uh, 3 programming assignments, 45 percent of your grade, 2 exams, which are also 45 percent of your grade, and then a small number of uh, points, which is about 2 percent for class participation, uh, in class quizzes and online discussion. Okay. That is just to encourage you to participate, not just come here and listen silently and then just go away. Okay. So, you can ask questions in class, you can ask questions on Piazza and participate in a number of different ways and there is some points allocated to that. Okay. Now, as far as the prereqs are concerned, 
the course assumes that you know something about undergraduate operating system. Okay? We do not actually enforce the prereq anymore. So, we do not actually check if you have taken a class in operating system. Many of you have, many of you may not have and that is ok. What the course is going to assume that you know something about operating systems. If you do not, I am happy to recommend a uh, textbook undergraduate OS textbook, which is also open source available for free. Keep that handy as we go along. If something is not clear, that serves as your reference book to just go and brush up on things you may have forgotten or just do not know about. Okay? So, if you have not taken a class in undergrad OS and are worried about how you would do, you should do ok by and large. I think many students have managed in the past, I do not see why this time should be any different, but it is expected that you know something. Okay? We are not going to go and start reviewing undergrad OS concepts every time I am going to teach a grad concept. Okay? Uh, and the second prereq of course is this is a system score. So, you need to know programming because 45 percent of the grade group depends on it. Okay. Uh, now, you can uh, ask what kinds of programming languages do you need to know. I mean, there is some flexibility there. We will allow you some freedom in what language you choose to, uh, you to uh, program in. Okay. It is not like you can choose whatever you want. We might give you a choice of Java, Python or C++, okay, which would cover most of what you probably know. Okay. Uh, so, but it is not like you can choose whatever you want, you cannot start doing things in scheme or something like that. Okay? So, I think we relaxed that last year, we said you can only do things in Python. Some students like that, some students did not because they did not know Python, they needed to learn. So, we said, okay, we will go back to what it used to be, we will give you more freedom. Okay? So, you can pick the language of choice, but then you are stuck with whatever you pick and you have to use that for your programming assignment, for the all three programming assignment more or less. Okay. Okay. So that's course grading. Now let me tell you, tell you a little bit about all the various electronic things we are going to use. So as a course mailing list, uh, you are already on it if you are registered for the course. Okay. You should have actually gotten an email from me this morning. Okay. And just welcoming you to this class. Uh, there is going to be a Piazza discussion forum. Okay. I mentioned that in the email. Please go sign up. Okay, 38 of you have already signed up, there are 120 of you, so we are only one third of the way in. Okay, we are going to make announcements there, you can ask questions and what not. Okay. Uh, there are two tools that we are going to use for you to turn in your work. Okay, we are use grade scope for written assignments, that is how you are going to turn in written homeworks okay. and also we are going to give weekly quizzes and that is also going to be used, uh, done using grade scope. Okay. We will be creating accounts for you on grade scope uh, if it has not already been done. So, you do not need to do anything, you will get an email saying you have an account on. Okay. And then we are going to use GitHub classroom for programming assignments. Okay. You are going to turn in your work through GitHub, okay. not just turn in your work, you are going to develop your code on GitHub. It is not that on the last day you just go and upload something to GitHub, that is not how GitHub works. Okay. It is a source code control uh, system where you are supposed to use it for your entire development, not just to turn things in. Okay. Again, there is nothing for you to do now, that is uh, we will create accounts for you and tell you how to get on to GitHub classroom. If you have a GitHub account, it is easy to also get a GitHub classroom account. Okay. Uh, and then uh, there is a course web page which is uh, listed there, I am going to show it to you in just a moment. Uh, there is also a YouTube channel for the course, everything we record here is going to go on YouTube. Uh, so, feel free to go back after class and look at it and of course, that is what the online section is going to use to follow along. Okay. We also have a Moodle uh, uh, site, but by and large it is going to serve as a grade book because we are not going to use Moodle for turning things in, we have switched to grade scope. So, it is there, but we are not going to use it a whole lot. That is where you can go and see how you are done overall in the class, that is all it is going to do for this semester. Okay. Any questions on any of this? I presume most of you have used grade scope for some class or the other, right? It is fairly common these days to use it here. Okay, so let me just quickly show you. I can exit from here. Oh, I missed. 
Okay, so that's the Piazza page. Uh, you see that I have there are uh, 39 enrolled. You should all enroll if you haven't already. So you can start seeing announcements and so on. I posted the email I sent there already, as you can see. Um, here is the course web page. That's the schedule for the course. Okay. At the moment, that schedule is subject to change because of uh, snow closures and things like that. Some things are unpredictable in the spring semester, but by and large, that's going to be the schedule. Okay, there are two important things to keep in mind that's already marked there. Okay, and uh, those are the dates for the exams. Okay, I said there's a midterm and a final. Dates are already set. Okay, uh, Friday, March 22nd, which is the Friday after spring break. Okay, is when we will have a midterm exam. It's going to be an in-class evening exam. Okay, both the online section and this section show up in a large classroom, which is being scheduled, and that's where we are going to administer the test. Okay, then the final exam is on Friday, May 3rd. It's going to be a take-home exam, so you don't have to actually show up. It's going to be given to you. You basically work on it. You have 24 hours to work on it. It's open book, open notes. Okay, and then you send us your final answers. Okay, so those two dates are set. Everything else is subject to change. Okay, and the other important thing, of course, is everything that we do here is going to get posted there. The slides that I'm showing you here are already there on lecture one. The recording will show up there. We will have students taking notes in class. Scribes taking notes. We'll put those notes up there also. Okay. And you'll see that there's a, there's a schedule where it says which days homeworks come out and labs come out. By and large, we'll stick to that schedule as well. Okay, so that's the course web page, and then that's grade scope, which you will see soon. That's where we will have our first quiz and whatnot very soon. Okay, any questions here? Yes, question. Yes, the slides will be posted before class, and I have to say one thing why they should be posted. Um, so as far as the course uh, policy is concerned for the class, there's no laptops or phones allowed in class. Okay, So you should, I mean, today I know that I didn't say this beforehand, so several of you have la laptops open, but this class is no device policy. Okay? If you come here, you should come here to listen, not or play on your laptop and get distracted and five people beyond you are looking at your screen instead of looking at me. Okay? So we are not going to allow that and there's going to be penalties if you actually start using uh, laptops in class or start doing something on your phone and things like that. So, so I, if you take the trouble to come here, I ask you to pay full attention and be engaged in class. Okay, there's no real attendance, so if you really don't feel interested, there's no reason to come and do some uh, something that distracts everyone else. Okay, now the reason I uh, mention this also is I will also post all of the notes before class. So feel free to print it out, come here and take notes. So you don't really need your laptop to take notes if that's uh, what you do in some other classes, for example. Okay, so, so that's a policy to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing is, of course, every class, uh, we are going to have somebody volunteer to take notes. Uh, today, we already have a volunteer. I volunteered them because there was no volunteer. But I will send around a Google Doc, which has a sign-up sheet. So if you feel you can help take notes for a class, please sign up, okay? And then we'll send you a reminder before the class saying you signed up for this class, uh, and then make sure you come to the class, take some notes. We'll also give you sample notes from the previous year. The lectures are by and large the same, so there are already notes from last time that you can use. Update those notes, send it to us, we'll post it for everyone's benefit, okay? So I will say at the end of the class, I'm going to send around uh, both on Piazza and through email, a Google Doc where you can go and sign up. It's first come, first serve. Of course, if somebody has signed up, don't go and remove their name. Okay, just sign up for some other class. And if it's full, that's okay. Uh, there are only 26 or so classes and there are 120 of you. So not everyone can sign up, but I'd appreciate if somebody signs up for every slot that is on that sheet. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Yes, the class slides will be posted there. Today's are already there. Of course, you didn't know that they were there, but you will see them often in the morning before the class, not two or three days before, because 
I do update the lecture slides. Okay, but in the morning, you should see the lecture for that day. The slide should be posted. Other questions before we move on? Okay. All right. So, we will also just to keep the material accessible, take a lecture and split it up into two or three modules. Each module will be about 20, 25 minutes. It is a self contained topic. Okay. That way, even if you find some material is not accessible, when you actually switch to the next module, it will start something new. So, you can resync and maybe uh, sort of keep up with what is going on in class. So, today there are two modules. Well, the first module was the syllabus, but that is not really a module. So, I am going to talk about distributed systems, give you a definition of what they are and a high level introduction. And then we will talk a little bit about uh, distributed systems and operating system models. Okay, that is the second module for today. Okay, so, let us start with what are distributed systems and why should we study them. Okay. Now, as it turns out, practically every computing system that you encounter in practice today is distributed in some shape or form, whether it is the World Wide Web, whether it is a large website such as uh, let us say Amazon or, or whatever your favorite website may be, whether they are P2P file systems, whether they are other kinds of network servers. Okay, every a modern net application that you encounter, a computing application ends up being distributed. Okay. So, the question we ask is how do these real world systems work and what are the underlying principles that allow us to build such systems in the first place. Okay. How can you build very large scale systems that run on thousands of machines? A single application is running on lots and lots of machines. How do you deal with failures when some machines go down and yet the application has to continue to function. So, there are lots of complex things that you need to deal with in order to design distributed systems and the purpose of this class is to understand how do you go about designing these systems. Okay, what is, what are the basic concepts and what are the practical ways you go about in building them. Okay. And as part of the programming assignments, you will build several by the end of this course. Okay. And so, you will get some sense of how uh, you can go out and build uh, ones that people use on a day to day basis. Okay, you will get a small glimpse of how to do that. Okay. So, that is basically what, uh, why we want to, uh, why we should be interested rather in studying distributed system. And here is a definition of what a distributed system is. Okay. So, essentially a distributed system is a collection of independent computers okay, uh, that are interconnected okay, and appear to its user. As, the, as if they were a single coherent system. Okay. So, every distributed system includes more than one machine. Okay. These machines are connected over a medium such as a network typically. Okay. And more or, moreover, these collection of machines present an abstraction to the user as if they were a single system or a single application of some sort. Okay. So, the users may not see all of the pieces that are used to build a distributed system. Some of that may be hidden from the users. Okay. That is a definition of a distributed system. It is a very loose broad definition. Okay. It can actually encompass everything from what are parallel machines, large parallel clusters to very large scale network systems that uh, maybe span the globe or even uh, have lots and lots of individual machines in them. So, it is a, a loose definition, but it works for what we are trying to accomplish in this course. Okay. So, that is the working definition of what is a distributed system. So, it is essentially multiple CPUs that are connected together that give uh, illusion of being one single logical system. Okay. Now, with that let us ask okay, what do we get by building a system of that sort? What are some advantages and what are some disadvantages? So, as far as advantages are concerned, it essentially building a distributed system allows you to communicate across these machines. It allows you to share resources on these machines. Okay. So, you can now run your application or your job on multiple machines. Okay. You are essentially sharing maybe storage across this machine, you are sharing CPU cycles across these machines and so on. Okay. It gives us better economics. Okay. We get a better price to performance ratios. Okay. So, think of an alternative. If you want to get a powerful machine, you could go and buy a supercomputer. Okay. That is in the old days that used to be a single machine, okay. very powerful. 
Okay. Or you could get lots of little machines and connect them together and then harness all the collective CPU power and storage across this machine and memory. Okay. The latter is a distributed system and the, the, that bullet essentially says that it is more cost effective to build machines this way. In fact, all of today's some supercomputers are essentially now large clusters interconnected on very high speed networks because that is a more cost effective way to build large scale machines rather than build one very large machine that is very, very expensive. Okay. So, better price performance ratio, you get better reliability for your application. If you build your application right on this kinds of systems or platforms, uh, even if some nodes of your uh, system fail, your application as a whole can continue to function. Okay, where other nodes take over the tasks that the failed node was performing. Okay. If you have an application that is purely centralized, it runs on only one machine, then if the machine fails, your application stops. Okay. If users are accessing that uh, application over a network, then they can no longer do so. There is a downtime that they are going to see. Okay. But if your application is running on a distributed system of machines, if even one or multiple nodes fail, so long as you built your application right, okay, the other nodes can take over the tasks of the failed machines and then your application can, can, can continue to function in a degraded mode, but it will still work. Users can still access your application. Okay. So, that says your better reliability, your better scalability. Okay. You can actually scale your application across n machines and harness all the resources that are on those n machines. Okay. And your potential for incremental growth. What that says is, if you have an application that is going to be um, distributed, but you do not know how, how popular it is going to be, what kinds of workload it has to sustain, you do not need to buy a very large cluster on your day one. You can start with a smaller cluster and as the workload grows, as the popularity grows, you can keep adding machines. Okay, that is called incremental growth and your application should hopefully, if built well, scale with the number of machines. Okay. This often happens in gaming platforms. Okay. When you come up with a new game, a multiplayer game, you do not know whether it is going to be a hit or a miss. So, you cannot go on the day it is released and put it on a lots of machines because you are going to have to pay a lot of money to get a large number of machines. So, you can start with a small cluster and as it becomes more popular, start scaling it up by adding more nodes. Okay. And that is true for many other applications, not just games. Okay. That is an advantage of doing it this way. So, those are some advantages, but there are several disadvantages also. Okay, the first one is uh, if you build distributed applications, you need operating systems, you need programming languages uh, that are uh, aware of the fact that this is distributed, they are distribution aware in some shape or form. You have to be able to write your distributed application using some language and so some construct. Okay, this increases the complexity of your application. Okay. Writing a distributed application has to be more complex than writing a centralized application because pieces of our application are going to reside on different machines. They have to communicate with one another. All of that has to be written into the application. Okay. So, there is higher complexity. Okay. Network connectivity is essential because it is at the heart of a distributed system. If you have no network connecting these machines, by definition you cannot have these application components interact with one another because there is no, no medium for interaction. Okay, so, if a network goes down, that is a problem for your application. In a centralized application that does not communicate with anything else in the world, that is network connectivity is not essential. Okay. Okay, and then last but not least, there is issues of security and privacy. If you have your application be accessible over a network, it is also accessible to bad guys just as it is accessible to good users. Okay, so, there is vulnerabilities that can be exploited by hackers, they can hack into your application, steal your data and what not. Okay, so, those issues now you have to start thinking about if you start building distributed applications. Okay, yes, question. Uh, sir, for economics, the example you gave was at the time of setup is more, uh, you get a better quotation performance price ratio if you set up multiple machines. Is that also that obviously true for actually keeping them up and running and maintaining them? Okay, so, question is uh, as far as the economics are concerned, we talked about the cost of the hardware. Okay, buying one large machine may be less cost effective than buying n smaller machines and connecting them over a network. Okay, and there is a question about 
is that true as far as maintaining the machines is concerned, because now you have to maintain n machines as opposed to one machine. Okay. Now, the, the, the answer is it depends. Okay. A large machine may be more complex, so you may need more sophisticated uh, system administrator or IT staff to maintain it than maybe uh, vanilla Linux machines. Okay. Having said that, now there are n of them. So, there is more things that can go wrong on any one machine. So, there is more attention that you have to pay as well. So, it is a little bit of a toss up as far as maintenance is concerned uh, as to how that actually works. But the co initial cost of the hardware, there is a clear advantage. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So, now let us talk a little bit about some other advantages that were not on the previous slide. So, not just advantages, but also some properties that your application may expose. And this is broadly labeled as transparency and distributed system. So, it is clear that uh, as I mentioned that any distributed application is going to be more complex than a centralized one. It, you will have your application split into pieces. These components are going to run on multiple machines. Okay. Now, you should ask what is it that the application needs to know as far as the system is concerned? What is it that the user needs to know as far as the system is concerned? What parts of this complexity are you going to hide from the user or even the application programmer when they write the application? So, that it becomes easier to write, it becomes easier to use this application. Okay? And depending on uh, the scenario, there are lots of things that you could simply hide from the user and make it easy for the user to use. Okay. And so, all the things that you hide are actually shown in the first column okay. and that is basically going to give you a transparency in that dimension. Transparency essentially means that you are going to hide something. Okay. The word might be a little confusing, but that is what it means in a context of distributed system. So, so if you are let us say location transparent, which is the second row there, that says that the location of the resources are actually hidden from the user. Okay? And you should ask uh, what, what things do you know about that are location transparent. So, take any website for example. If you say I go to cnn.com or google.com, okay, the name of this website does not tell you the location of the machine. It does not tell you that the machine is whether it is in this country, somewhere else or what state it is. Okay? But you can access that application without having to know where the server is located. So, you are just using a name and the system takes care of figuring out where the machines are and getting a request to those machines. Okay? That is an example of location transparency, because the user does not really need to know to in order to access a search engine where the machines are located. You just need to know the name of the search engine, in this case it is Google. Right? So, that is one example. Okay, Let us take another one. Let us take the replication example. Okay. Replication transparency says the fact that your application is replicated onto multiple machines is also hidden from the user. Okay. Now, again I am going to use the same example of a large website. Okay. It could be a search engine like Google or a shopping website like Amazon. Okay. Because these websites handle lots and lots of concurrent users, Okay. It should go without saying that the entire application cannot run on a single machine. There is no machine cannot sustain that much workload. Okay. So, typically these services are going to be replicated on lots and lots of machines, often tens of thousands of machines or even more. Okay. Now, when you send your search query to Google, internally it is going to actually send it off to one of its many, many machines that are part of that system. Okay. But as far as you, the user is concerned, Neither do you know that the service is replicated, in fact, that it massively replicated, nor are you expected to say go to machine number 1011 and that is the one that is going to service your search query. Okay. Because that I mean you have to pick a machine and then go to one of those machines and submit your query. You do not, you are not expected to do that as far as the interface is concerned and the system simply hides the fact that it is replicated from you. All of that is dealt with internally by your system. Okay. This makes it easier for you to access that service, because some complexity of how the service is built, in this case the fact that it is replicated is hidden from the user. Is that clear? Okay. Now, you can think of services that are not necessarily 
replication transparent. So, for example, if you are accessing a cluster, you can actually SSH into a specific node on the cluster. Okay. In this case, the cluster is not hiding the fact that there are n nodes in that cluster. You can log into a specific node, so it is not replication transparent. Okay. So, you need to know which node to log in in, or to, in order to do accomplish some task. Okay. So, not every distributed system is going to be transparent along all of those dimensions. Those are all properties that a specific application may have or may not have depending on how it is designed. Okay. But by and large what this slide is saying is there is a lot of complexity when you design the system. So, do not expose things that the user does not need to deal with or in some cases the, the application itself when they write the code does not need to deal with. Let something else deal with that complexity for you. Okay. This makes it easier for either the application programmer or the end user to either use or build their distributed systems. Okay. Now, which of those properties should be present in any specific application depends on what the application is trying to do, what kinds of features do you want to pro present to the users, what kinds of complexity do you want to hide from the user. So, there is no one answer and as we go along and we look at different systems and different applications, you will see that some of them actually hide certain things, but expose other things and others do it differently. Is that clear? Okay. I am not going to go into every single thing there. Okay. This is just because we have not even started looking at some of these topics, but you have to understand that there are lots of properties of an app uh, distributed system that you may or may not want to expose to the end user. Okay. That is the thing to keep in mind and that is called transparency in distributed systems. Okay. Now, you can also design your system in many different ways. Okay. So, one is called open distributed system. In an open distributed system, okay, open in this case does not mean that the source code is available. Okay, this does not mean it is open source. So, that is a different kind of being open. In this case, what an open distributed system says is that its interfaces or the APIs are openly specified, so that you can write other components that can interact with that system using well defined interfaces. Okay. So, there are many APIs you might have seen already or used. Okay. So, I will give you an example. So, the Google Maps API is published and open. Okay. If you want to incorporate a map into your application, you simply have to use those calls and then you get the data and embed the map in your application. Okay. That is an example of an open system, where the interfaces to interact with that system are published. Okay. And you can, so long as you have rights to use those interfaces, you can use them and incorporate them into other applications or other clients and whatnot. Okay. So, needless to say, building your systems in this fashion is a good thing. It allows others to take advantage of what you have built and use it in some other context. It allows you to extend your system, the functionality of your system because others can build on whatever components you have built in your distributed system or application. Okay. But not every system is open okay. and uh, there may be systems where they do not actually publish the interfaces and then in that case it is a closed system. Okay. That is the opposite of open obviously, it is a closed distributed system. The system may provide valuable services to users, but you cannot actually build on what has been done and add other pieces and other components to it, because you do not know how to interact with the system, its APIs have not been published or made available to you. Okay, so, you can have either of these kinds of systems and by and large more, more systems are going the open route because they see value in having others use their services or build on their services. Okay. Now, let us talk a little bit about scalability because this is I think a good argument for why to build systems that are distributed. Okay. To understand this, let us first take a look at centralized system. A centralized system or an application is something that just runs on one machine. Okay. So, any application that runs on a single machine is called a centralized system. Okay. So, a centralized service essentially provides a single uh, service for all users. Okay. Such a service might have centralized data, which means all the data that it accesses is stored on a single machine. It could be in a database, it could be in a file, that does not matter, but all the data resides on one machine. Okay. Or that centralized service has centralized algorithm, which means all the code that that application or service uses is running on one machine. 
okay. Now, all of those uh, uh, have scalability mo uh, or bottlenecks, so scalability issues or bottlenecks. Okay. Think of centralized data. Okay. If there are lots of accesses to, to this data and all of that data resides on a single machine, okay, you are eventually going to saturate the machine. It will get overloaded and you cannot uh, service requests that come in when the machine is overloaded. Okay, then the system is going to have to turn away requests to start dropping requests. Okay, so, so that is a problem. Now, if you replicate that data, you basically make multiple copies of that data, then you can put those replicas on multiple machines. So, when requests come in, you can either send them to one of the many replicas and then your load has now gotten partitioned across multiple machines. So, you can scale your system better. So, that is not centralizing the data, that is distributing or in this case replicating that data. Okay. Now, same is true of centralized algorithms, you can make an algorithm distributed, you can also replicate your code on multiple machines. So, in this case when a request comes in, you basically send it off to one of the replicas that is going to do the CPU processing needed to service that request. Again that allows you to scale your system you are no longer limited by the capacity of a single machine. Okay, you basically can now use capacity CPU, this case CPU capacity of multiple machines. Okay. Now, that argues that when you write distributed systems, you want to not centralize your data, not centralize your code and so on. Okay. But doing all of that is going to actually increase the complexity of your application. Okay, you can say let us replicate all of that data. Okay, but whenever you replicate data, your consistency problem. If you make any change to your data, all the replicas have to be updated. Right? If you update something in a database and the database now is copied onto multiple machine, you have to go and update all of the copies. Otherwise, some copies are out of sync. They have stale data or old data. Okay? So, now when you replicate or distribute your consistency that you have to deal with, that increases the complexity of your application. Okay? Same is true of distributed algorithms. We will look at distributed versions of many algorithms that you may have encountered already. All of those are far more complex than a, a centralized algorithm. Okay. Simple thing is th things like a lock, which you probably know of if you have done any threaded programming. In this case, in this course, we are going to look at a distributed lock, a distributed implementation of a lock, whereby an application that runs on multiple machines can actually grab a lock because in this case the lock has to be distributed, it is not centralized. And you see that that is far more complex than writing a centralized version of a lock. Okay. So, it is going to increase your complexity, but you get some benefits for that added complexity. That is the way to keep in mind. It is always a trade off. Okay. So, when you write a distributed application, you might say I am going to cent not uh, replicate my code for the algorithm, but not replicate the data because I do not want to deal with inconsistencies. So, in that case you have a distributed application where the data is not centralized, but your code is centralized. Or you may do the opposite, you might have the data distributed, but not the code or you might have everything distributed. So, you can get many different choices of how you go about building your application. And you will make these choices as you do your programming assignments. Okay, we will have something centralized initially and then they will become distributed and you will see how the complexity of your code is going to grow also, okay, but you will also learn how to do these things. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. Now, there are many techniques we can use to scale and avoid all of the problems that I was mentioning with centralized algorithms, centralized data and so on. Okay. And here are some good high level principles for designing distributed applications. Some of these will not make sense right now because we do not have the necessary background covered yet, but I am going to mention them here and then we will come back to it at a later point. Okay. So, the first principle is no machine has complete state. If you write your application such that you do not need global knowledge of what is happening everywhere else in the system, you are going to actually be more scalable. If you need to know whatever is happening on every other machine in your system, okay, that adds overhead and that also ad, uh, reduces scalability. Okay. So, for example, if an application is distributed on 10,000 machines and to make some decision you need to know what is going on on all of those machines, then that is going to limit your scalability. Okay. So, so let us say a request comes in, 
you say I need to know which of these machines should service this request. And so you might say I need to know the load on all of the machines, so I pick the least loaded machine. Okay? But now if I need to go and probe 10,000 machines to find out their load and then decide which machine needs to service that request, that is a high overhead that you just imposed on your system because you are going to have to learn information about the of your system in order to simply decide which of those machines need to service a request. That is what state means. Okay? So, if you assume that you have to know complete state that is going to lead, result in a less scalable system. Okay? So, that also leads to the next principle which is use local information as much as possible to make decisions rather than global information. If you can make decisions based on what you know locally about your own machine as well as nearby machines, that is always going to be better than trying to go and figure out global knowledge, okay? because that is much harder to gather and keep up to date at all times. Okay? Uh, yes, question there. What is an example of make decisions based on uh, local as opposed to global information? So, so, I will give you an example. Uh, we will in some uh, lectures talk about distributed scheduling. Okay? A job comes in to a machine, machine gets overloaded, it wants to offload some tasks to some other machine. Okay? Now, if you can decide which task to op offload and which machine, which other machine can take it uh, without having to go and ask all of the machines about global knowledge, that is a much more scalable algorithm. So, simple algorithm could be randomized, you just say I randomly pick a machine and say take some work from me because I am overloaded, okay, that you are making that decision locally without having to find any other information of the system, that is an example. Okay. Okay. So, third thing to keep in mind is uh, failures, a single failure should not bring down your entire system. Uh, so, there should not be a single point of failure in your system, that is a good design of a distributed system. If your components that run on one machine and if that machine goes down, your entire application that may be running on 500 other machines stops working, that is a problem from the uh, systems perspective. So, you do not want that to happen, you do not want critical services to be running on only one node of your distributed system and then if that there is any problem with that node the entire system stops functioning. Okay? So, you want to design your application without having a single point of failure. Okay? The fourth one is a little hard to explain because we do not have enough background yet, but it says that you should not assume the presence of a global clock. What that simply means is you should not assume perfectly synchronized machines. Okay? Okay, there is we will talk about clock synchronization as we go along. Okay? Clock synchronization allows you to synchronize the time on all of the machines, so that you can actually do something with this. Okay? So, you can timestamp events and then figure out what time a certain event happened and then maybe compare it with other events and what not. Okay? But if you need perfectly synchronized clocks for you to make that decision, that is going to be hard because you will see that there is no such thing as a perfectly synchronized clock. All clock synchronization algorithm come with some error okay? and you have to deal with the consequences of that error because there is no, no, not going to be any perfect synchronization. Okay? Now, I will leave it at that and we will come back to this issue later on and you will understand much better what global uh, clock means and why is it not possible to have a perfect global clock and what do we have to do because uh, we cannot have a perfect global clock from a synchronization stand. So, we will defer most, most of that to the topic on synchronization. Okay? And then there are some other techniques that we want to keep in mind. Uh, one is using asynchronous communication, asynchronous events and so on that is going to let us scale our application more than using their synchronous counterpart. When we talk about distributed communication in about three lectures from now, we will come back to asynchronous communication, we will think about how this helps us build more scalable systems. Okay. We will talk about distribution which is just saying I take my application, I split it into multiple uh, machine or multiple components and put the components on multiple machines, okay, that is distribution. Uh, replication which is I take each component and run it on more than one machine okay. and caching which also says that I actually have multiple copies of the data. Uh, some in caches and some on disk, they are all ways for us to scale our system. 
a distributed system. So, you want to distribute the components of your application, replicate them if necessary and we will use caching as a way to improve performance. Okay. And we will come back to all of that later as well. Okay. This is just a very high level summary of some things that you need to keep in mind to build scalable systems or scalable distributed systems. Questions on this? Okay. So, that is the end of module 1. Okay, we did a very quick overview of what is a distributed system, okay. what are some pitfalls of a centralized system, how can you scale distributed systems. Okay. So, now we are going to switch gears a little bit, look at module 2, which is really going to ask, okay, how, what do distributed systems in practice look like today, how have they looked like in the past, how have they evolved and then we will say ask the same questions about operating systems, because this course is about both operating and distributed systems. As you know, we will look at different kinds of operating systems architecture, uh, which are both centralized and distributed as well. Okay. So, let us start with the distributed system uh, model. So, what this slide actually shows you is how distributed systems have evolved over decades. Okay. The very early distributed system used what are called the mini computer model. Okay. It was one machine really, it was not really a distributed system uh, uh, entirely, but there was one machine with lots of terminals attached to that machine. So, you could log on to that machine, that machine had a slow network to other machines, you could communicate by and large communication meant send email and things like that with other machines. Okay. So, users essentially had to log on to a machine and then uh, use a very slow network to communicate with other machines or use something like FTP to download files and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, it was not that useful from the kinds of things we are used to today. Now, with advances in uh, hardware technology, the that model evolved to a workstation model. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in the workstation model, what you could do is every user could be given their own machine. Okay. There was a LAN to connect those machines that allowed you to not only use your machine, but also use resources on other machines. Okay. So, you had a very early form of a distributed system where you could run code on multiple machines and so on, because there was a workstation and these workstations were connected over a network such as an ethernet. Okay. So, very early forms of a distributed system. So, that model evolved to what is called the client server model, which even exists today. Okay. In a client server model, the machines that are part of a distributed systems are not identical. Some machines are more powerful than others. Those more powerful machines are called servers, because they provide services. Okay. And client machines are the ones that are using these services. Okay. So, in a client server model, your clients that use services that are provided by machines called servers. Okay. In a workstation model, machines are more or less identical in terms of their processing uh, speeds and capacities and so on. Okay. Even there, some machines might act as clients and as servers, but that be becomes more explicit in a client server model. Okay. So, as hardware technology evolved, you could buy more powerful machines and use them to run services. They could be file servers, print servers, database servers and what not. And then there were client machines, which were actually the workstations that were still on people's desks that were used to access services on those machines. Okay. And that model is there even today, when you have things like the world wide web and what not, your clients, which are browsers and servers, which are web, uh, web servers, for example. Right. So, so that is the client server model. And then uh, out of the client server model also evolved another model called the processor pool model. Okay. In this case, the server that we have here okay, has become more powerful and it actually exposes a pool of CPUs. Okay. They are actually CPUs could be on multiple machines, does not matter. So, it, you can think of it a loose form of a cluster of machines. So, your pool of processors, okay, uh, your Clients can actually be workstations or they could be what are called thin clients, which are simply diskless terminals. Okay. And so, this ter diskless terminals are essentially accessing services on one of the CPUs from the processor pool. 
okay. that was another early form of a distributed system. Okay. That actually today has evolved to things like cloud computing and what, but this was basically think of your server as a pool of processors, your clients are low end nodes and to, in order to access a service you send a request or what have you to this pool and some processor in that pool is going to serve your request. Okay. So, so that's what is called the processor pool model and now the year we have the more modern versions of whatever I talked about on the previous slide. So, we have now uh, what are called cluster computing system that are modern forms of your processor pool model. So, in this cluster computing you essentially have a cluster of servers, it is a rack of servers or many racks of servers. In case of a data center it is basically many, many racks of servers that provide computing and storage to end clients. Uh, then you have grid computing systems where you take these clusters across multiple sites and you connect them up over a wide area network such as the internet. So, now you can not only access your resources on a single local cluster, you can also access resources on other clusters that may be at other sites. Okay. That is an even more distributed system than a single cluster. Okay. That is essentially what is called grid computing or also wide area clusters okay, or distributed data centers. Okay. Now, lo lots of applications you see such as Google search engine actually are distributed not only across clusters, but across sites and across countries. So, single application now spans many, many di different data centers, many sites, many countries and yet functions as if it was a single application to the end user. Okay. So, so, that is basically the most modern evolution of uh, this cluster computing model and we will see things like cloud computing which is essentially a data center where you can go and rent resources. You do not need to own the entire system yourself. You can essentially lease or rent servers and storage on demand as you need them okay. and you get built based on whatever you use at any given time. Okay. As part of this course you will end up doing some programming assignments on cloud platforms as well. So, if you are not familiar with it by the end of this course you will be, yeah, but I am assuming many of you have used cloud resources already in some shape or form. Okay. So, this slide shows you the modern variants of large scale distributed systems. This is not the entire story, we will see the other forms of distributed systems in just a moment, but what, whatever I showed you on the previous slide which is here were very early forms of distributed system. These are modern forms of distributed systems, large scale distributed systems. And the evolution of these distributed systems has continued, okay, it does not stop. And what you have seen here is the systems have grown bigger and bigger from one mini computers to n workstations to a pool of processors. Now, you have tens of thousands of machines across multiple sites. That is because it is very cheap to get servers and build very large scale system. Okay. Now, because it is also very cheap to build uh, computers, the evolution of distributed systems has continued and you have now what are called distributed pervasive systems, where you have essentially computing everywhere. Okay. The, the essential uh, insight here is the uh, processing has become so cheap that you can put tiny CPUs anywhere you want. Okay. Your watch has now multiple cores, okay. your phone has 8 cores okay. and your servers might have 32 cores or even more. Okay. So, it is very cheap to now put processing capacity anywhere into the fabric. So, things that you do not even consider as computing devices or distributed computing devices are actually forms of distributed computing device. So, this includes things like uh, your car, okay. it might have multiple microcontroller, it has a full fledged LAN. Okay. So, multiple CPUs connected over a network okay. that forfeits our definition of a distributed system. Okay. Your TV might be a smart TV, your phone is a smartphone. You can think of all the devices that you see, everything now has embedded processing in it. Okay, that is, and it has network capability. It allows that device to communicate with other device. So, it is part of a distributed system. By itself, it may not be one, but as it communicates with other, the collection of these devices are distributed systems. Okay. So, this has essentially made computing ubiquitous. Okay. And as computing has become ubiquitous, 
it has also become distributed. So, even the small devices now that you see are actually forms of distributed systems, okay. very different from the large scale ones where your large server clusters sitting in data centers. Okay. So, we will look at both types, okay, the uh, more traditional forms of distributed systems as well as these more modern forms where you have wearable devices, you have all kinds of sensing devices that have computing communication capabilities that are actually a distributed system of some sort. Any questions on this? Okay. So, in the remaining time that we have, we are going to now switch gears a little bit and look at how operating systems have evolved. Uh, we looked at how distributed systems evolved from very early mini computing models to modern data centers, distributed data centers and pervasive computing. That is to the same kind of you know, sort of uh, discussion of operating system. Okay. So, this what is on this slide you should have if you have taken a course on undergrad operating system encountered already. This basically shows early forms of operating system, which are essentially uniprocessor operating system, single CPU machine okay, and OS that runs on that CPU. Okay. Now, as far as what do we mean by an operating system, essentially the OS is the piece of software uh, that essentially runs when you boot up your machine. Okay. It acts as a resource manager, it manages all of the hardware resources on those machines. And furthermore, it provides easier to use abstractions to end users, so they do not need to deal with the complexity of the machine. Okay. Your OS is going to give you a file system on your disk. Okay. So, when you create a file, you do not need to as a user worry about which block of the disk is it stored on. The OS file system will take care of that for you. You just give your file a name and you access it using its name you do not worry about where it is stored. Similarly, when you start up a process or an application which becomes a process, you do not have to specify to the OS, give it this much memory okay. or say the, there are n applications running, this is how you should take your RAM and split it across all of these processes. Okay. The OS is going to take care of that for you, you just start up the application and use it. You do not need to worry about how resources are allocated to it. Okay, how much CPU, how much uh, all of that is dealt with by your operating system. Okay. So, essentially the OS has provided us with a virtual interface okay, or a logical interface that makes the hardware easier to use. You do not need to deal with the low level complexity of your hardware or the devices that are on your machine. The OS will deal with that for you. Okay. Now, so that is what an OS is. Now, as far as the structure of early operating systems were concerned, they began by and large as monolithic uh, op uh, kernels. Okay. Monolithic kernels essentially says that your OS kernel is essentially one piece of software that boots up whenever your machine uh, starts, is powered up. Okay. So, it runs as one large process essentially on that machine. Okay. Now, the as our operating systems grew in complexity, designing an OS kernel as a single monolith made it very hard to uh, grow, maintain and develop. Okay. So, over the years, the kernel architecture also became more modular. Okay. Uh, today's operating systems are highly modular. You can have devices that, device drivers that you can plug in, modules that you can plug in to an OS kernel to extend the functionality, which makes it much easier to develop a large piece of software. Like any other piece of software, making it modular is actually a better software engineering design goal. Okay. Now, one way to not have your OS be monolithic is to make it layered. Okay. Your software is layered, which means that you partition the functionality of your software into a set of layers. Each layer can communicate with the layer above and the layer below it. That is the definition of a layered approach. Okay. You cannot have any a layer just talk to a layer two layers above it. It can only communicate with the layer above and below it and indirectly then communicate with other layers. Okay. Now, the most common example of a layered design is the network protocol stack. If you encounter TCP IP, okay. TCP IP uses a layered approach. So, that part of your OS is layered because you have the 
the physical layer, well, physical layer is not in the OS, it's basically the actual wires that you use for communication, but you have your MAC layer, your network layer, transport layer, and all of those. So, that's a set of layers that you use to implement a protocol stack such as TCP IP. Okay? So, the network protocol stack inside a kernel uses the layered approach. Okay? The rest of the OS does not actually use a layered approach, but that makes that, that part of the OS more modular. Okay? And when we talk about designing web applications, we are going to return to the layered approach. We will see that a layered approach or it is called a tiered approach, but it is the same as the layered approach is very common when you design large scale web applications you will encounter soon what is called a multi-tiered web application. That is a layered approach where you took your web app, partitioned it into layers and each layer can only talk to the layer before and after it or the above and below it. Okay? That is one way to modularize your application and the OS has basically started this notion of a layered design. So, here is another design for designing your kernel which is called a micro kernel architecture. So, it is very different from a monolithic architecture. Okay, in a micro kernel architecture as is shown in this picture, your OS kernel is a very small compact piece of software that is actually going to be running on top of the hardware. Okay. Much of the functionality that normally resides in an operating system kernel actually has been pulled out of the kernel and they run as user processes in user space. So, as you will see here that essentially memory management Okay, is no longer done inside the kernel, it is done as a separate user process. Okay. File management is actually now also running as a user process. Okay. The entire file system pro part of the kernel has been pulled out and it runs as a process, okay, as a file system process. Okay. And there are many other processes such as process management and so on. Okay. Now, what is being done by the micro kernel is very little. It enables inter process communication. It, these are still parts of the operating system, they are just not part of this address space. They have been pulled out, they are independent processes. Okay. Now, these all have to communicate with one another, one another to achieve the task of managing all of the resources on that machine. So, this micro kernel is going to allow you to, uh, to, to have these processes communicate with one another and it is going to provide you safety so that you cannot go and do bad things to some of those privileged processes. Okay. That is all that you are actually going to do inside the kernel. Everything else runs as a user process. Okay. That is a very different design from a traditional operating system kernel where all of these things actually happen inside the OS. Memory management happens inside the OS, process management happens inside the OS, file systems are actually modules inside the OS and so on here they are not. Okay. So, this is called a micro kernel architecture because a kernel is very compact and small. Okay. So, let us talk for a couple of minutes why would we do this and what does it give us. What do you see are some advantages and disadvantages of building an OS this way. Yes. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by isolation? Okay, so you said several things. I'm going to just pick two of what you said uh, from there. So, so what one thing you can realize is happened is uh, essentially you have taken pieces of the OS and pulled them out, and each of those component now runs as a separate user process. Okay, now when you do it this way, you will see, as was rightly pointed out, each of these processes is somewhat isolated from other processes. They are independent processes. Okay. Now, one argument that the micro kernel designers give is that this is a more secure way of building an operating system kernel, because if there is a bug in one of those components, okay, it does not allow you to compromise other components. Okay. If they are all part of a single kernel, if there is bug in one part of the kernel, you can essentially uh, use that bug to essentially uh, compromise the entire OS kernel. Here, you can only compromise that one process you do not get access to other processes because they are not part of your address space, they are not part of your memory space, they are part of other memory spaces. Okay. So, you might take a bug and crash that process, but it is not going to bring the entire OS kernel down because that rest of the function, so, uh, 
components contained with the function. So, this is given all of the security flaws you start seeing in OS kernels. The designers of the microkernel architecture claim that this is a more secure way to build your uh, uh, OS kernel. Okay, so, essentially you pulled off these pieces out and uh, made them their own independent components. Okay, that is an advantage. There are other advantages, but we will leave it at that. Uh, might there be some disadvantages of doing it this way? Yes, Jacob. Okay. So, what is being said is inter process communication or communication between components might actually incur more latency. Okay. Now, if you think of a monolithic architecture, if all of these pieces were part of one kernel, if this component wanted to make a request to that component, that would be a function call inside your program, because they are all part of the same program. right? And function calls are cheap. In this case, if the memory module wants to communicate with the process module, it has to send an explicit message. That message has to go through the microkernel and arrive there. Okay? And that is how you are going to access services of another component. So, now think of function calls and message passing, orders of magnitude difference in speeds. Okay, this is going to significantly impact performance of your system okay, and that then is essentially the biggest drawback of microkernel architectures is slow performance. Because there are com components that communicate frequently. Okay, which could have just communicated by just calling functions inside the same program. Now, I have to start sending lots of messages back and forth, which is going to slow your performance down. Okay. So, back in the uh, 90s, so this so microkernel architecture was first made popular uh, at a project at Carnegie Mellon University. There was a project called Mark, which came up with this idea, made it popular and so on. Okay, and in those days, many commercial operating systems actually decided to adopt this idea. Windows went with a microkernel architecture, Mac OS X also went with a microkernel architecture. Okay. But soon they realized that performance was a big problem. Although you got more security, performance was still an issue. So, then they started walking back and saying this is too much of a slowdown. Let us take some pieces and start moving them back. Okay, so, things that were pulled out started going back into the kernel for performance reason and you are left, left with some sort of a hybrid. Okay. So, even today both Windows and uh, Mac OS X actually derive their heritage from this idea, but I mean today's kernels are not micro kernels anymore. There are other micro kernels, but not commercial operating system, but they started down that path and then they put some things back. Lots of things are still outside the kernel, but not everything. So, so two things security and performance. Okay, these trade offs basically are very important. Okay, if you start putting things in the same address space, your security issues, if you pull them out, then you have performance issues. What is the right balance? That is something a system designer has to think of. Okay, so, so that is microkernel architecture. Very quickly in the five minutes we have, we are going to talk about distributed operating system. Okay. So, a distributed OS is essentially now an OS that runs on more than one machine. A unique uh, processor OS essentially runs on one machine and only one CPU on one core of that machine, not even one machine, it's uni processor. Okay. Uh, there is also multi processor operating systems which just are kernels that essentially run on one machine, but manage more than one processor. Okay. They are not distributed systems because these processors are on one machine, they are not independent machines, okay. but there is an evolution from uniprocessor to multiprocessor operating system. But now when your OS is asked to manage multiple machines, not multiple processors, but multiple machines, you get a distributed OS. Okay. Now, the purest form of a distributed OS essentially makes it look like this entire collection of machine looks like a single unified machine to the end user. The user essentially logs into a logical machine without knowing what physical machine they are accessing at any given time, because that is hidden from the end user. Okay. All of these processors look like, although they are on independent machine, look like one collection of processors on a single machine. All the storage resources look like they are one large logical disk and so on. Okay. So, the OS goes 
to some extent in this case to hide the fact that there are multiple machines. So, you see some forms of transparency already, the fact that there are multiple nodes hidden from the user. Okay, you can only access this pool as if they are single logical machine. You SSH into a virtual machine, not like a virtualization virtual machine, but a logical machine that is a collection of these physical machines. Okay. So, it provides a various forms of transparency, but it is also very complex. Okay. But from, from the user's perspective, it looks like centralized machine, it just looks like one large big, big machine. Okay. Although that machine does not exist, it is simply an illusion that the OS creates. Okay. That is the purest form of uh, distributed operating system. But that is not what you actually have in practice, you do have some forms of it. What is actually popular is what is called a network operating system, which is simply a unique uh, pro processor or a multiprocessor kernel with the networking capability. Okay. Your Windows is a form of a network operating system, Linux is a form of a network operating system, because you can SSH onto other machines, you can send requests to other machines, it is providing networking services, so that you can access things on other machines, but it does not hide anything from you, everything is visible, nothing is actually hidden. So, you have higher complexity, because you need to now actually log into a specific machine and do certain things, rather than letting the OS deal with it for you. Okay. That is called a network operating system. So, it is a loosely coupled OS, where the OS runs on individual machines, each OS manages one machine, but it offers networking services, so that you can access remote machines. Okay. Think that basically, that the, anything, any OS you see today, essentially is a network operating system, okay. whether it is Windows, Linux or a Mac, because they are all have networking capability. And then there is something in between, which is called a middleware OS, which takes a network OS, adds a software layer on top, so it looks like a distributed OS. And I have a picture here somewhere. <coughs> Let me skip this, we are over time, so I am just going to quickly show two pictures. So, here is an example of a distributed OS, where you essentially have this uh, services and on top you cannot see the fact that there are multiple machines that gets hidden from the end user. Okay. And here is your network operating system, where you have a kernel and the kernel exposes some networking capability, applications run on top, but they can see all of those machines and they have to explicitly deal with what runs where and what not. Okay. So, that is the difference between the two. And then when you have a middleware, essentially you take a network OS and you write a software layer that makes this collection of machine look like a distributed OS, because the OS is not giving you that capability. So, we will stop here, we ran out of time, I will revisit this next time and just finish the couple slides that we could not cover.